in case you were worried that our brilliant organizers had neglected the social sciences, our next speaker is in the field of education. I'm pleased to introduce Michael James, who's a fellow at Boston College in the Roach Center for Catholic Education. Michael earned his undergraduate degree at Notre Dame and his PhD in Education Policy Studies and Higher Education Administration at Indiana. He brings more than 25 years of experience in Catholic Higher Education Administration to his current position. Um, he has worked at Notre Dame, Indiana, and M Mount Marty College in South Dakota. He now directs the Institute for Administrators in Catholic Higher Education and coordinates as well as teaches in the graduate program concentration in Catholic University leadership at Boston College. He is the co-editor of the open access research journal, Catholic Education, a journal of inquiry and practice, and book editor for the open access ac academic journal, Claritas. Good morning. It's great to be here. Um, I love my librarians, and that's why I'm here today. This is sort of, uh, a, a, I'm going to tell you, a, I was thinking of a, an idea of a, of a fairy tale, but, a, but it's not so much a fairy tale. It's a, it's a real life love story. A love story between a struggling journal and its librarians. Okay. And I'm going to be very brief. I'm going to be using six slides and five numbers to tell you my story. 1997, the journal was established by four Catholic universities in order to provide an opportunity for scholars who were interested in a variety of areas uh, of application in education and a variety of social sciences uh, to inquire about the world of Catholic education, K through higher education. Unfortunately, many of those uh, scholars, teachers, uh, researchers were finding that uh, their subject matter, if it included the word Catholic, was not being published uh, in peer review competitive journals. Uh, so this group of leaders from four of the, the prominent schools of education at uh, the 240 Catholic colleges and universities that are in the United States decided, let's start our own journal. So 1997, our journal was born. Four institutional members comprised the advisory board. Uh, a fee from those institutions was acquisition to establish some semblance of a, a structure for the journal. Today we have 22 institutional members who comprise the advisory board. They each pay an annual fee institutionally uh, to maintain the journal's costs. Uh, and I'll give you a little more about the structure of the, uh, the financial structure of the journal in, in a minute. But at the beginning of the journal, the mission was as is currently stated today, uh, to provide a journal that promotes and disseminates scholarship about the purposes, practices, and issues in Catholic education at all levels. So this is a story of transition and perhaps even transformation. Fifteen years now the journal has been uh, in uh, a quarterly journal uh, schedule. Uh, we have tried to advance scholars' work. Uh, it's started out as a peer-reviewed journal, continues to be a peer-reviewed journal today. But in the last 14, the first 14 years of the journal, we operated in a traditional journal model. Uh, we used it as, as our base to, to pay for the costs of a print journal and the mailing and distribution costs, uh, subscription. Uh, subscriptions haven't changed all that much in terms of cost. I think it began with a uh, $20 subscription fee annually for a quarterly journal. Uh, a year ago it was at $29 uh, for an annual fee quarterly journal. 700. 700 was the peak number of subscribers that we had uh, to this journal over a 14-year period. Uh, that number plateaued about three years ago, three to five years ago, and it began to decline uh, in that period of time. Uh, 
And most of the advisory board's time was spent contemplating new methods, stronger means, compelling uh, approaches to marketing the journal, improving uh, our subscription base. Forty thousand. That's the total distribution number over the lifetime first 14 years of the journal. Uh, so we had, I simply calculated on, on an average 700 subscribers for quarterly journals uh, a year, uh, plus distribution at academic conferences. And over the first 14 years, we distributed the journal in unit numbers, about 40,000. When uh, we realized that our time and our money being spent thinking about how we could increase our subscription base uh, seemed to be uh, hitting a wall. And so our cre creativity level, our enthusiasm for the journal, uh, sort of our institutional enthusiasm as well, as our institutional members were finding it more difficult to convince their provosts and their presidents or their deans to uh, pitch in for the annual fee for the journal without showing some sort of impact number. Um, we found ourselves really at a crossroads. So we had a plateaued subscriber base. Uh, we had declining sort of enthusiasm for the journal itself. We saw uh, the, the most uh, challenging aspect of the journal was that we saw a declining quality in the manuscript submissions. And we saw uh, an increase in our, um, our acceptance rate uh, to, to the journal. So these are all downward trends. I mean, this is the death of a journal, as we saw it. Uh, one of the aspects of our journal is that uh, every five years, a new institutional member takes over the editorial offices. And three years ago, Boston College became the editorial host. And that includes a number of uh, financial requirements and, uh, and responsibilities. But as we took over the journal five year, three years ago, uh, it was our decision that we were not going to be the institution that killed the journal. Uh, we're going to look for a new life for the journal. So we went to some of our smartest folks on campus, our librarians, who said, help us think through this. We didn't go to our School of Management and Business to look for a new business model. We went to our librarians to look for ways in which we could think creatively about how it is that we could disseminate our journal in a way that's getting into the classroom, uh, that's compelling for scholars, that has a distribution beyond which uh, we were thinking in our sort of small, compact way. They came up with two terms for us. Think about open access. So we began to think about it. Uh, we researched it, we had a variety of meetings, we went to our board, we suggested that we begin to think about new methods of distribution and, and maybe even transforming the journal in ways that we think, if they're commensurate with our mission uh, and with our sort of moral sets of, uh, of values that the journal espouses, uh, and if it met the requirements of a good business model, perhaps we should consider this open access model. In 2010, we went open access. Uh, and I think perhaps I'll leave more time in the question and answer period to talk about that deliberation process that our board went through. But in 2010, it seemed to make sense. Open access was the way to go. Um, it was difficult to pull our group away from the hard copy paper um, tradition. So we had a six month period in which we produced both open access and a print journal. January 2011, we began sole open access online uh, journal. Now, one of the advantages that we found uh, that we didn't uh, wholly anticipate is that our statistical uh, access to the, the journal's readership, um, who's hitting the site, uh, more importantly, uh, who was downloading and how many downloads of articles were, were being met. But we could track that. And we thought, oh, that's a nice thing. We'll see over a couple year period how this might uh, prove to our board uh, and our institutional partners that this was a good, a good way to go. So remember, over the first 14 year lifetime of the journal, we had a distribution number of 40,000. And, and I think that's actually sort of um, generous. The first 10 months of our open access, sole open access journal, 
Uh, this next number represents the total number of downloaded articles during the first 10 months of open access. And that is the right number. Now, when our librarian sent me uh, two months ago uh, the statistics for our downloads, it was at 80,000. I called Jane. I said, Jane, um, is this the right number? Jane Morris, who's uh, our librarian, uh, and she said, yeah, that's the right number. I said, okay, put this in perspective because I'm a little bit excited about this. Um, does this mean something's going on well for us? She said, this is a pretty darn good number. Um, two days ago as I was preparing uh, the final slides for this, I spent a lot of time on the slides, by the way, uh, for this presentation, um, I asked for the updated number. Uh, and in fact, we exceeded 100,000 uh, as of uh, three, three days ago. So that's a pretty compelling case. So a fairy tale, let's say the princess kisses the frog, our little journal of Catholic education. Um, we see the opportunity here as not simply a great partnership that makes sense with our library, but also the aspects, the sort of justice aspects of open access that we espouse, but it also has provided a whole new life to our journal. We're looking now at the opportunity to capitalize on this kind of a download level per month, uh, an average of you know 10,000 downloads per month. Uh, so we're looking at a companion site that will be more dialogical, more uh, complementary to a conversation uh, that we can that we can couple with our static online journal. So, thank you.